Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie. And today we are honored to have on the show, Mr. Jim Cullen. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you, Roger Trey. Thank you. I'm very excited to have you on the show. You've written this great new book. It's called The Case for Long-Term Value Investing. And if anyone could write this book, it would be you. You've been, you've been at this quite a while and uh, you know a thing or two, I would say, about value investing. First thing I loved about the book is that it kicks off with this concise history of the stock market dating back to the 1920s. And right. you know, we, we, we study folks like Ray Dalio, who's been on the show, and he says that today's market most resembles the 1930s, but with inflation now climbing higher, some wonder if it's more like the 1970s. If right. it's the latter, it's important to note how volatile the market was and how it resulted in a flat return from 64 to 82. I'm just curious, what time frame does today's market most remind you of? Well, let me answer that sort of directly. The way we started, you know, our book with uh, background, and um, you know, I was on the aircraft carrier 1961 to 64. Uh, market was going up every year. Looked like it was going to be fun, uh, easy, and I got out in 65. Went to Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch was opening offices all over the country as was everyone and the uh, it was the markets were booming and the, the um the we had mobs of people every day in our office over there and uh it got so bad and so crowded every day that we had to put a plexiglass up to separate the brokers and the crowds and people were cheering for stocks and more and it was uh mayhem and um so it was, it was great it was, I was, this is lucky and uh so that's, you know, the speculation was high. Two big things in the speculation, they had something called the pink sheets, which were this on a clipboard, elaborate, maybe two inch thick uh, ream of papers, colored pink, which had all the over-the-counter stocks. And people were fighting, brokers were fighting all day to pick stocks out of that and repeat, you know, prices to their clients, what have you. And uh, also those, um, a character, and I mentioned in the book, uh, called Charlie Plum, we called him Two-A-Day Charlie. And what he would do is come out with two new issues every single day. And uh, the, all the investors were strictly clamoring for him. And uh, so it was similar to the, I guess, some of the things we, we see today. And uh, the um, actually what happened, Lincoln, to the 30s, which Ray Dalio mentioned the 30s, uh, what they, what Merrill Lynch did, they had three older experienced vets brokers in the in our office to give some stability and these older guys were uh you know buying you know names from the 30s and they had nicknames for the stocks betsy and uh, old you know steel and uh all the nicknames and uh, they all were dividend stocks and they uh we used to say well these guys they're all like they all wear red suspenders and smoking cigars and we said it must have something to do with dividends what are dividends anyway and uh, but we were millennials, most of us there, and we were interested in the hot moving, fast growing stocks. Airlines were big, Pan American, TWA, world travel is going to expand dramatically. Uh, we had uh, tel color television stocks were hot, and uh, so anyway, we had all these new stocks. An uh, uh, industry was formed called conglomerates, where they were lever highly leveraged companies or build on debt, and they were just buying up all the kinds of companies around, and they were uh, the most active stocks every day. So it was really a real casino. And I tell in the book, I said, it's like a British betting parlor. I mean, it was mobbed every day. Uh, then all of a sudden, 1968, the market rolled over. And um, the market, the next seven years, had two major stock market recessions. And by the end of the market, 1975, by the end of 1975, all those brokerage firms were shut down. Most of them were gone, and most of the brokers were gone, and many of the firms that were also involved were also gone. And uh, so that was sort of the uh, the initiation of the, that that period of the era of the seventies, which was really much worse than the tech bubble. And uh, of course, the thirties was even worse than that in a way. But uh, so I would say, you know, you wouldn't want um, <laughs> a similar kind of experience. But there were two shocking things that came out of that. One, um, later on, not then, but later on, I went back and checked. 
what happened between 1965 and 1982 when the market was flat and didn't go through a thousand for that 17 year period of time. And uh, what happened is actually the bottom, the cheapest stocks on a PE basis, the bottom 20% of stocks on a PE basis actually went up a thousand percent over that same time period, which is pretty much the same as they went after the bull and the bull market between 1982 and 2000. And that, I found that was shocking after having been through it. And because the market during that period was going between 700 and 1,000 back and forth, and I just couldn't break through 1,000. But the problem was the market had been overpriced. Um, and that's always the Achilles heel of all these speculative bubbles, similar. And um, well, the other thing that happened, the um, and we mentioned this in the book, every single, in the 1930s, 1970s, 2000, and every bubble period, uh, it takes five to 10 years before those stocks basically uh, correct enough. And even though in every single case, the uh, fundamentals for all those stocks were good all the way through the next 10 year period, but all of them were 10 years later were down. I remember in uh, 1982, we bought IBM and Avon products under 10 times earnings with a big yield. And they had been, you know, at, you know, 10 years before they were at, you know, 60 times earnings and 50 times earnings. And the same way with RCA. Um, and then in the, um, the same way we had here in the uh, tech bubble, uh, Microsoft and some of the other big tech stocks, we wound up buying as value stocks back in, uh, you know, 10 years after the market top in 2000, uh, 10 or 12 years later. I mean, we bought Microsoft, you know, it was like 10 times earnings with a three and a half, four percent dividend yield. So that's been the common thread in these past markets. Uh, I mean, what we have now is a sort of period of, let's say you're going to have a hard time avoiding stagflation, I would think. Interest rates are going up. Uh, a lot of factors are going to, I think, put a lid on uh, the market growth. So you may go through a period of stagflation. Uh, so our answer probably to that would be the answer, which was back in the uh, 70s. You know, if you bought the cheapest stocks on a PE basis, that was gonna, that's going to bail you out in the long run anyway, no matter what happens. And uh, so I think it's irrelevant which one we're most similar to. They all follow each other, are similar and all a bit different. And it's hard to believe that uh, some stocks like uh, Amazon, it's going to take 10 years for it to base out. Uh, but I remember uh, four or five years ago, uh, Barry Diller, who's probably as savvy as anybody, was talking about Amazon. Uh, Netflix, I'm sorry, was talking about Netflix. And he said, you know, they have, they have such a lead on everybody else. He said, that stock is never going to have a problem. Well, <laughs> you know, three or four years later, that's not the case. And uh, so that's, you know, the, um, so by the, as I said, by the end of 75, my experience was that Everything else had been wiped. People have been wiped out. Margin accounts were gone. And uh, that's, you know, we hope that we don't get that experience here. But we do have the, uh, I think, the stagflation risk, um, which means that as far as an investor goes, you want to be careful, I think, because you don't know how these things play out. On that yeah. note, I'm curious with the 60s and 70s, with that, the last time we had stagflation, the market volatility seemed to just be insane. So while everyone's sitting here trying to say what's going to happen next, you know, interest rates are going up, the stock market is just going to go down, almost like it's binary. But it, it seemed to just bounce up and down in this range uh, pretty violently. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, every time you thought the market was going down, it's going to go lower. And then you said, this time it's going to go through a thousand. And it didn't do it for, you know, 15 years. Uh, so whether you trade like that here or not, um, it's hard to say, but that's the, the volatility is extreme. We, we did a chapter in the, in our book on the, uh, bull markets, I mean, bear markets, bull markets and recessions and how, and go back over the last 60 years, analyzing every recession and bear market and how that played. You say, because you say as a investor, you say, if I could time that right. And I can avoid, and that's what you hear the commentary on the on TV every day is people trying to figure out 
you know, we're going to have a recession or we're going to have a bear market, what have you. Um, to our feeling, is it doesn't make any difference. But uh, if you look at, you know, what, you know, what happens with the, um, you know, with the, with the um, bear markets is that first you get the, rece- the, the bear market, then usually the recession comes later. You don't know the recession's there because it takes the government a couple months, six months maybe to figure out where it is. And uh, then you get what looks like a really bounce off the bottom. Studies done have shown that if you took over that 60 period, year period of time, if you took the bounce off the bottom uh, and all those recessionary periods uh, and took that out of the market, you basically wipe out the advantage of owning equities over that entire time period, which is extraordinary. So uh, the key thing is, and he said, well, if I get out, I've got to get back in. So you're probably better off not to get out. And uh, and the bottoms look like it was, if you look at the long, long chart, it looks like that would be easy to sort of figure out where the bottom is. But then if you expand that out, some of those bottoms took a year. I mean, we think of a bottom being made and all of a sudden the market turns around. These things could drag out six months to a year. And uh, so that's why you don't know where you're at. Uh, so if you're trying to take a shorter term trading positions on the markets, you know, it's a tough game. And um, so that's why I guess our investment strategy to get around that is, you know, buy cheap stocks, um, you know, and especially if in a tough market like this, cheap stocks with, with dividends and uh, stay invested and don't try to time it. And that's the big, you know, that's what we get around to is the message which we're talking about here. So what you just said a minute ago stood out to me. You said basically to you, it, these, this volatility doesn't matter. And, and that's because you're holding for the long term. And in right. the book, you lay out this very rigid, disciplined approach, um, essentially using the framework based on Ben Graham, which is as follows. So look for companies in the bottom 20% of the index when ranked by price to earnings. Look right. for companies in the bottom 20% of the index when ranked by price to book. Look right. for companies in the top 20% of the index when ranked by dividend yield, and then invest for the long term. So my first question is, can investing really be this simple? And second, how do you keep faith in your system knowing that things change and evolve over time? So for example, price to book becoming less relevant for non-cyclical stocks, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, the, they're the three disciplines Graham mentioned. And uh, you know, we get the number every year for the S&P 500. The shocking thing to me is we don't use price to book much at all. I mean, we look at it on all the companies and uh, and it's, it's appropriate for very cyclical you know, material companies. But for um, most companies, healthcare companies, what have you, it's immaterial. But the performance of that on a historic basis, even recently, has been pretty good, which is surprising to me. I wouldn't think it would be the case. What we do in most of ours we start off strictly with a value strategy, number one, and then we usually want to take less risk. So we found by adding the dividend portion to that, and then the to get growth plus less risk is dividend growth. So those are the things that we're usually focusing on, and uh, that gives you a lot of downside protection. And if you do well when the market goes down, uh, over time, you're going to do well overall because market's going up more than it is down. But if you do well on the downside, it's going to be a big bonanza for you. We've, what we know is that over time, earnings double about every 10 years. And that's going back to 1920s. It's consistently that. The thing is that when earnings is that, track, uh, is that just across the board, small caps, large caps? Well, that was the S&P. Done? That study was done on the, on the S&P 500, basically. And... Uh, what we did was we, we uh, once we did the, um, P, the the low PE stocks, we said, how about dividends? And what it turned out that dividend yield on the S and P five hundred was it was much smoother than earnings on the volatility over the seventy year period of time. So we blew those charts up each recession, and what it showed was in every single recession going back to nineteen sixties. The dividends, oh, the thing is gone, by the way. Um, the, uh, by the 19, going back to the 1960s, the, um, you know, every single period, 
every single year during every recession, the dividends were increased by the S and P every single time. The only the only exception was uh, TARP, you know, the most recent, and that was artificial. And the, the bounce back in dividends after that was one of the biggest bounce backs ever. So, so what you have is, and what we found out in the dead decade, 2000, 2010, uh, you had, you know, the peak, of the, the tech stocks, you had 9-11, and then you had the financial crisis, all that in a 10-year period. Probably one of the worst 10-year history periods we've had. And uh, so if you look at that, actually the dividend strategy, value plus dividend strategy, during that period was actually up almost double during a 10 year period of time. And the market was down about seven or 8% per year down that on the same time period. So and if you go back and look at it, well, why did that happen? Well, if you started off in the beginning of the year 2000 and you had 3% dividend yield on the, on the portfolio, but dividend increases as you went through the whole 10 year periods kept inching up, inching up, inching up. And so by seven or eight years later, you had about an eight, nine percent dividend yield on the, portfolio at cost, which means the stocks aren't going to stay there. And they went up. And that's why the market went up. So dividends are very underrated. Um, and so we've become more and more, that's going to become a bigger part of our, probably 80% of our business is in the high dividend strategy, high dividend plus value strategy. Um, so, you know, and, and the if you look at the history of value versus growth, the reason why uh, value wins over that is because when the market's going up and it's a hot market value will trail pretty consistently, but not by much. But when you get a tough market value dramatically outperforms. And this year's this, you know, this year, in the last year and a half has been a case. That's been a case that I'm doing a market letter right now, which is uh, highlights that. And, uh, um, so, you know, the, the market's changed, the market's changed and you have a situation where, you got all the earmarks for a stagflationary kind of environment. So you want to be taking less risk. So now it's probably more important to have the dividends than normal. There seems to be this sort of tortoise and hare thing between growth and value. So I saw a chart recently, for example, where, you know, the Kathy Woods ARC funds, you know, they just had this incredible rise and it, it's uh, now come back, come back down and they overlaid it with Berkshire Hathaway, who's, you know, just been chugging along. It's very, like, not very volatile at all. And now, you know, the performance of Berkshire is outperforming uh, that of ARC. And so I think it's just a great uh, archetype for what you're talking about there. Yeah. Given that a lot of younger investors, you yourself, you know, coming out of the Navy and looking at these high flying stocks, it's so easy to get uh, seduced and, and tempted by these high flying stocks. And they eventually turn into these acronyms, say FANG or, you know, Nifty 50 back then. While the dividend yielding stocks might be slower to grow, you know, with price appreciation, right. but may grow more reliably. So do you think the pendulum? for dividends specifically, is swinging back into favor for the next few years. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and as far as, you know, the uh, millennials, uh, which I was, right, uh, the real smart thing I should have done is, uh, you know, do your trading on one side, but, but set aside some money for investing and make sure you know the distinction. And as far as investing, you don't try to market time and you leave that alone. We have a chapter in the book on a bunch of doctors. I was at... Uh, uh, Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jenrat before I started the firm. And I had a bunch of doctors come in and that were what I was working with. And they had these IRA plans. They could put $25,000 a year in the IRA plans, usually four doctors in, the, in, the, in, the, in a group. And they put them away. These guys were making a lot of money in those days. and uh, But they didn't touch those IRA plans. And except for the guys who got married a couple of different times. <laughs> and they were making all kinds of crazy investments, what have you. But the one doctor, especially, tried to preach them, preach to them to stick with that, not touch that money. And uh, the ones who listened to him or didn't get divorced, um, well, now those accounts are like $40 million. And uh, they're up like seven, 8,000% over, over the time period. And uh, it was money that they just set aside, and there's no way they would have um, done that any other way. And um, we have an accountant down in Florida, and he's a what happened to these? Where did these guys come from? He says, I never saw an IRA plan worth, you know, 40 million bucks. <laughs> and it's because they stuck with the plan and held them. Um, 
the uh, the temptation to change. And that's why I wrote the book. We said, you know, the average investor, number one, they get no education in, in, in schools or what have you on the stock market. And uh, Jason Zweig, actually, the New York Times, or Wall Street Journal, rather, who I know, and he, he wrote an article recently, and he said uh, they are getting some education, but it's the wrong kind. They're having these contests where they say, who has the best performance for the month? And what they do, if you want to get the best performance for the month, you get the most leveraged, the most leveraged stock, and uh, you know, and leverage it and put do a lot margin if you can, and uh, that's going to win in that in, in market. And uh, that's sort of the way a lot of pension funds are on their money. Also, <laughs> you get these one, three, five year presentations, and you look at them and you say, "Just why is that?" I tell a story. I think it's in the book, but I think I tell a story. The first meeting I went to was a big foundation. And we're sitting there, and the Merrill Lynch broker was presenting four different mutual funds. And one was just dramatically better than all the others. So one of the people on the board there was saying, why the hell wouldn't we choose that one? And they did. And it turns out that, you know, two years later, it was a disaster. And it had been the most speculative stocks and leveraged. And therefore, we got the best performance. And so the one five-year, one three five-year can really come back and haunt you. And um, But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Well, speaking of uh, five years, I mean, do you, when you mentioned uh, these younger people getting, again, tempted to compare their performance month over month, right. really, they should be looking at a longer period, right, to smooth out volatility. So is that the five year? Or what, what do you typically go for? Because what Graham said, he says, you know, be a long-term investor and use a strategy. Well, with, with the average guy says, well, what's, what's that long-term? <laughs> and so we said that, or we came to the conclusion that using a five-year time horizon, gave you enough time to smooth the performance. And so we have in the book, we show all the five-year periods going back to 68. And uh, you had maybe three periods where you had a small amount of change over the time the time period. But then what happened, the five-year period after that was huge. And so uh, the five-year time rise to smooth all the performance. And we have it later on in the book on the uh, total recessions and bear markets. How can you avoid those things? Well, in every single five-year period, Going back to 1968, you take all the five-year periods, you get double-digit, most of them double-digit returns on the five-year using a discipline. And every single five-year period, you have some bear market, some recession, and you can try to drive yourself crazy trying to figure out when and when to get in and out of that. And, uh, but it smooths it out. And uh, if you take the 10-year, it even smooths it more. I mean, the 10-year, you say, why would anybody... I look at the pension accounts and they... Uh, they have all these different alternatives they use in real estate, what have you. And I think, you know, using a dividend discipline uh, strategy um, would seem to be better than almost all those things. I mean, you get a double digit return in uh, every single 10 year period. One of the quotes I loved in the book was from Peter Lynch, who said, it's amazing to me how many people try to predict the stock market. If you spend 14 minutes on economics, you've wasted 12 minutes. <laughs> I just thought that was really great. So how can we as investors avoid this? The, you, know, you spell it out a little bit in the book about avoiding these recessions. Is it just by buying and holding over the long term and not you know, basically turning our phones off and not looking at our screens anymore? Yeah, I, I watch Bloomberg and... Uh... And you know, and uh, CNBC every morning for an hour or so, and this, and I'm looking at it. I have a, I can go and yell out the window here and say, "Oh no, don't do this!" <laughs> but you sort of, it's sort of nice to know what's going on, and uh, you're still looking for the best ideas you can get out of the framework. So, uh, um, yeah, but it's as long as you're focused on not trying to trade that thing or take advantage. As long as you have some investment money on the side, away from that. Then yeah, well, that's, that's a different story. I want to talk a little bit about risk-adjusted performance. So, how can retail investors focus more on risk and more specifically, actual risk-adjusted returns? Yeah, well, they have risk. I mean, you can you can you can use standard deviation or alpha, uh, beta. You use that as a guide or what have you. And I still say the best way to evaluate risk is to have a dividend discipline and be a long-term investor, and that takes care of it. Um, and, um, and yeah, that's my solution to, to the best way to, to deal with risk. And if you look at these numbers on the book, if you look at these numbers, you say, everybody should be doing this. And, uh, but the temptation to, I also have in the back of the book, it says, um, 
what happens when every year you sit down and say, I'm going to make an investment, say, but the market's too high or there's a recession coming on or we're going to get stagflation. Yeah, let's wait a year. And uh, I've been going back to 1920. All, every year, there's a reason not to get your money in that year. And uh, yeah, so you sort of got the market over the same time period as a phenomenal return. So you just got to go with it. Actually, uh, John Templeton did a study over a 20-year period of time. If you bought the market every year, if you're making a contribution every year over a 20-year period of time, and you bought the worst possible day every year, you're gonna, and the best possible day, the difference is only 1% over the 20 years. Amazing. So the, yeah, the compounding takes care of it. So are you a proponent then of you know, dollar cost averaging, uh, every sure. paycheck, that kind of thing, going to yeah. your 401k? Oh, yeah. Save it whenever you can do it, you know? I mean, that's one message in the book, you know? At the end, I have the 14-year-old paper boy, paper girl, you know, compounded interest, and now that's the secret to investing, really. And how they start when they're 10 years old, when I put a small amount aside, the compounding. I mean, that's really the, the key for people to get started. That probably should have been the first chapter in the book. <laughs> well, you've been running this fund for, for multiple funds, uh, mutual funds for a long time. And I'm kind of curious, you know, if that's the case and we're just kind of uh, dollar cost averaging, there are cheap means to do that, you know, with the Vanguard S&P 500, for example, which I, I saw on your website is is a benchmark. I mean, most people look at that at least as some kind of benchmark. I'm curious what the mutual funds bring to the table in your opinion, this day and age, you know, how actively managed are they? And, and how do you go about getting alpha with your, when you're primarily buying and holding for a long time? I mean, some of the index funds can be okay. The tricky thing about some of the index funds, of course, is that the index funds compete with the market. And uh, so they're going to stretch you know, the parameters to take a little bit more risk because we're trying to get performance. And uh, so especially the, uh, we, we have a, a, a period in there where we talk about just the S&P 500 index fund. How it gets really overloaded with the top five stocks. And it becomes, once the top five stocks were the highest P multiples, once they become like 25% of the company, that's usually when it's getting way overpriced. And so therefore, after the periods like that, then the index really dramatically underperforms. So you get wider swings in performance with the uh, with the indexes, and people cheat on even even value. You know the value indexes. If you look at the value uh, different S and P uh, one thousand value index, what have you, you'll see they put names in there. You say, well, these are value names. Um, but I think they're trying to make that index more attractive or more. They say more representative. Is is the idea of the low PE performing over time just a reversion to the mean philosophy, if you will? Just as, as it, yeah. a statistic approach? Is that because you got to hang your hat on something, you know, yeah. over time? And yeah. is it just that you look back at the data and back tests and say, you know, over a period of time, this does revert back? It might take years, right. but eventually it does. Right. right. That's exactly it. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, that's a that's a summary for it. <laughs> so. You mentioned who you wrote the book for. I'm, I'm actually curious about that. It, it's written in this very approachable way. You, it's very bite-sized, I would say, almost, some of the sections. Uh, was it for younger people, maybe even in your life, you wanted to pass along? Or you mentioned there's a lack of education. You wanted to just get something in their hands that could help guide them over time. Combination of two things. One, I think the thing that really started me is that uh, value had been out of favor, so out of favor, like 10 years. was unusual. And uh, so it was a long period. And I remember going to a pension consultant who we used to do business with. And I said, Have you, when's, when are you going to do a value search for, an, for a pension plan? He said, we haven't done a value search in 10 years. I said, oh, my God. So not only was value forgotten, I mean, not only was it not being used, but basically been forgotten. And so I said, we got to, that's why I changed the name of the book was going to be long-term value investing. I said, we got to make it a case for long-term value investing. Because we got to start building the blocks from bottom up, and uh, so it started there. And then what I know from being in the business for fifty years is that we're talking to clients all the time, and they just, and most of them, you're trying to educate them as you go along, but it's hard conversationally to get through to people. And uh, so I figure if you write this thing in a book, and then it, it's something that people can 
rely on a bit more. When people read something, then it becomes their idea, not you're telling them something. And I think it has more of an impact. And um, so then I, the secondary was really to educate investors, educate young people. And um, so it's a combination of the two things. So then you're using the the filters, if you will, so to speak, with the low PE, high dividend, low price to book. But once you've screened all of that, right. how do you pick the winners? You know, what what are the next steps from there? Well, we have a yeah, you know, we have a chapter in the in the in the, in the book on the uh, the research side, and use all the parameters, you know, price to book and uh, uh, pay uh, payout ratios and dividend yields and all of that, um, all the various ratios. Then you're looking for diverse, number one, you want to have diversification because what you know is the strategy works. So you don't want to get locked into too many drug stocks, too many computer stocks. You want a diversified list of holdings. So we say traditionally, no more than, we try not to do any more than 10 or 15% in any one industry and uh, be diversified. We know the strategy works. So we want to stick with, the, so we participate in the strategy and we don't get overwhelmed with any one group. So we start there. And then we're constantly, we get a portfolio, which is dramatically cheaper than the market. market right now is, say, roughly 20 times earnings. Our portfolio is around 13, 14 times earnings. And we're always trying to get new names in the portfolio that are cheaper than what we already own. And it's an ongoing process. And in the book, we have where the ideas come from. They come from wacky places, all kinds of different places. Um, um, I mean, I took one about a Canadian national. Um, we, we owned uh, International Nickel. And we were meeting with the analyst after the he, he was visiting them and he was updating us on Canadian on uh, international nickel. And uh, he said at the end of the meeting, we're leaving. He said, "Oh, by the way, is you know that rail companies in Canada are going to be spinning off. They can't make any money in those things. Whatever you're going to spin them off. But we had just made a lot of money in the U.S. because of revising and revitalizing the U.S. rails. So we heard that. We said, "Wow, I want to get involved with this." And so we started right at that point. And I uh, went to a couple of meetings of where there were pre-meetings where they're spinning these things out. And uh, uh, we made about 3,000% on our money on Canadian National and Canadian Pacific. And uh, so that was, you know, from them. Um, you never know where the ideas are coming from. So we have research meetings. We have, well, we used to have one every day in my office. And uh, now we have two a week because of the COVID thing, what have you. We haven't gotten back every day, but uh, now we have twice a week. But we're just constantly looking for where the ideas come from. And in the book, we have about eight or nine different places where, you know, things come from. Yeah. I love that part of the book, the, by the way, chapter. And, and, uh, <laughs> it reminded me, uh, you know, we were just at the Berkshire Hathaway show and Buffett talked about buying Allegheny. And it, it, to me, it spoke to this sort of idea of luck where it's preparation meets opportunity, right? Someone right. mentions that to you, but you, you had clarity on the opportunity you were able to identify it and right. and take advantage of it, whereas you know with Allegheny it, it basically happened in a similar way where the uh, new CEO you know used to work uh, was an old colleague of Buffett and so basically called him up to catch up and then he yeah that's when the idea came to him after forty years of like studying right. the stock it was finally right. like hey maybe now's a good time so yeah these ideas can really come from anywhere so when I'm looking at the funds. One thing you brought up a minute ago was diversification. And a lot of times with these funds, there's only 30 to 45 stocks. So that's right. a that's really, uh, you have to be really rigid to make it fit into the portfolio. So what are some of the other qualifiers um, for, say you found this rail company versus another rail company, they've got similar metrics. You know, does it come down to management or what are some of the other factors that- one thing I sort of one thing we sort of missed here, and I have a book uh, in the book I mentioned management and the importance of management. Jamie Dimon, uh, for instance, and um, uh, one thing about and 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 Iger of uh, Disney. The one thing I didn't mention, and actually, when you think about it, uh, equally important when a good manager leaves company. <laughs> you know, I mean, you want to you want a good manager. We, we in the book we mentioned three or four managers that were the reason why we bought the stock, and. Uh, but actually, when, when when somebody leaves, usually more often than not, it's probably a good idea to re, re reevaluate the company because there's an adjustment that goes on. Um, so manage is always a, a big part of it. Uh, we have in there called a, a three point fix. So you get stocks which are 
three point fix is a Navy term. It's, you know, you go in the harbor, you get a uh, one point fix, you know, as the harbor's fogged in, you're probably going to be okay. You're going to get in out the, the, your slip. And uh, you get two points, you get another the fix, and that gives you a better chance. If you get a third fix, you're going to get in the harbor no matter how fogged it is. And um, so that's why, so an investing ad, characteristics, long stocks, cheap, makes sense, what have you. And then you think you have it. You never know whether you have a story or not, but you think you have a good story on something. Then if you can catch something which periodically will go out of favor and time that, and that's the third point, the fix, getting something that's been out of favor. We went back and looked at the stocks that were the stocks we made over a thousand percent and say over, over time. It's usually when for some reason um, you get a stock that makes a lot of sense and we think we have a story. But for some something happens and the stock gets sold off and becomes a really cheap on a valuation basis, on a price basis. And uh, so we're constantly looking for that also. And um, like one we use, I think one of the examples we used was Merck when they had Vox. And I mean, Merck was always selling at 20 times earnings. It came down because of the uh, competition in the industry. And, the, and, the, and then all of a sudden it gets down to like 10 times earnings because of Vox. Yeah, it was, was giving you lawsuits what have you and uh and if you bought then the next thing it was you know up a thousand percent over the next five years yeah. but uh so anyway, like that's always a guessing game to a certain extent that's inexact science the uh <laughs> the picking the stocks is that what gets you out of bed in the morning i'm curious because you know with this systematic strategy there is that art piece to the science, as you kind of mentioned. So is that uh, what, you know, I'm just kind of curious, you've been doing this a long time and you're, a lot of this is buy and hold. What keeps getting you out of bed to go do this every day? Well, that's why I watch the, uh, the, uh, CB, CNBC when I have you in the morning and I get value line. I think Buffett does this also. I get value line every week and that gives you a lot of coverage on all the stocks and that gives you all the financial data on them and who has how much debt when I have you. So you're looking for companies with less debt usually. Um, but, you know, a combination of all the things you put together and you're hoping something jumps out at you. And um, and that makes it fun. Uh, there's a guy who does a report, 13D Research. Um, and uh, he does very thematic um, strategies. And we've got a couple of good ideas out of him. And there's certain people you rely on that have been very helpful. Very cool. So I'm kind of curious going back to the younger investors who, who I think this book will really speak to, who are so driven to growth. There's a lot of data in this book that you lay out. What should these younger investors know about growth oriented stocks based on the data in the book? Well, just the history that uh, you got to be careful because all of a sudden, if you get caught, uh, the history, these things. Eh. And all this, and every single cycle, the companies that peaked out had great earnings for the next usually five or 10 years. The earnings continued fine. It was just the prices got too high. So that's the danger. Amazon, for instance, here. I mean, Amazon, worst guy, I mean, you're getting, starting getting competition in their industries. Companies get so big that uh, they start competing with each other. And then all of a sudden, instead of buying little minnows, they wind up, you know, dealing with sharks. And, and uh, so how, how much of an impact that has on a company. Um, but eventually, you know, they could have, usually the, the business continues to be halfway decent, just the growth rate slows because it's got more competition. And then all of a sudden you wind up, you know, in every single case we wound up there, you wind up getting these stocks down to where their value levels and they can be bought for a value guy. Whether this happens here or not, I mean, you look at, uh, uh, it seems like early in the game, but um Alphabet looks like it's only 20 times earnings, so it's, it looks pretty inexpensive. So I know our guys are doing some work on what stocks are. But the young guys we have, all of a sudden, they want to get more of these more interesting stocks early if they can find them. Yeah. Do you ever find periods where you can have your cake and eat it too? Meaning you find a high-paying dividend stock that's undervalued, and because there's that cyclical rotation, you're getting that price appreciation along with the high dividend payment. Well, that's what you're looking for. And what you want is dividend growth. I mentioned dividend growth. So these are companies. I mean, we don't look for just dividends. 
we started the strategy in 91. The only thing they had to, equity income was a category. And equity income was a high, high yielding stocks, most of them utility stocks, but dividend growth wasn't a factor. And we started, we said, okay, you know what? You can have a broader diversified list, but look for dividend growth. And that's a key part of the strategy. And so, uh, so we're looking for companies that can grow that dividend. And uh, our average growth has been about 10% a year over the last five years. And um, yeah, that's what we're looking for. Kind of curious to hear on that point, then your, your feeling towards share buybacks, you know, Berkshire, for example, has, I think they issued a dividend once and never again, you know, so what do you, what, what's your opinion on finding stocks that are doing lots of share buybacks if, if it's seemingly at a good price? Well, seemingly at a good price. The queen. I mean, most of these companies that I've seen buying their shares back are buying it back at ridiculous P multiples. And, um, I think having a dividend discipline gives companies a little bit more of a discipline themselves because it's not like, you know, just buying shares and you may do it or you may not do it, postpone it or may not postpone it. Once you establish a dividend policy, they want to stick with it. Unlike global, the Europeans, you know, they, if the earnings are going to go down 30%, they'll cut the dividend by 30%. But in the U.S., as I mentioned earlier, uh, we the S&P 500, they've increased dividends every single year through all the recessions. Uh, back in 1975, when I mentioned that period with Wall Street, when Boston, um, the, uh, you had a dividend increase every single period during that whole time period. And it's phenomenal when you look at it. Say, meanwhile, you knew earnings were down 50%, stocks are down 50%, they're still increasing the dividends. So you want to make sure you have companies that have you know, a, a low payout ratio. You don't want to buy somebody who's paying at 90% of their earnings and dividend. You want somebody who has a lower payout ratio and where they can grow the company. And um, that's the question. And uh, it's a trade-off. The more you can get in dividend growth, the more companies, I think it used to be um, dividends weren't as important for companies. I think I think a lot of people started to realize that dividend yield, the dividend yield is uh, more important as far as stock price now. Um, but you still have a huge focus on buybacks, which I don't get. Yeah, they. It's always kind of seemingly controversial the buyback thing right now, and uh, if done correctly, it can be a great thing. But I like your take on dividends and that focus. So you've been running this firm for a very long time now, and I'm curious. I'm going to get to a couple a couple of points here in a minute, but one one I guess is, has there been a time in your career where you felt like you things were hitting on all cylinders, you were in the sweet spot of your strategy, and it was playing out well? And what what environment did that look like? And what year was it? You know, when was that kind of time? If you could reflect back, this is probably back in uh, after the market peak, you know, in two thousand, and rolled over. And uh, we started a mutual fund at that point, um, two thousand one, two thousand two, <clears throat> and actually we did a sub advisor with Pioneer, um, which was the um, you know the British um, and the Italian uh, advisory firm, and we did a sub advisory with them, and that was the right time. And we were like in the top one percentile, the one year, five year, three year, you know, was posted in the um, the Wall Street Journal once a, once a month. And we were there consistently in the top of that. So that everything was going right. And uh, we raised about $7 billion in about three years, four years. And uh, so everything was clicking in there. And, um, and then all of a sudden you get to a period where, uh, you know, you, you values out of favor and you have to struggle. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, you know, certain folks seem to acknowledge the macro. I mean, I imagine when you're looking at when you're watching CNBC in the morning, it's hard to avoid, you know, they're always bringing up macro stuff. So it's that importance of uh, awareness, but not necessarily letting it influence your, your strategy. And that seems like so easy to just say, but so hard to actually play out in practice. So do you have any things in place for you so that you're not touching the dials when, you know, maybe you shouldn't be? Yeah, I go back and look at that, the chapter we have in there on recessions and bear markets. And you look at that and you say, the temptation here to try to get this right is almost overwhelming. But then you go back and look and say, okay, let's superimpose the rolling five-year periods over that with those recessions all blocked in. And so instead of seeing all this jagged down, up, what have you, you know, you get this smoothed out recovery, uh, 
picture with all these recessions on in each one of those five year periods. And that's your religion, I guess. <laughs> that keeps you in the, in the game. But it's hard. I mean, we have doctors who do the uh, kept with the, with the program, but it's pretty hard to keep people in over a long period of time. 2000. And on no, no, 99, the year before 2000, um, we had people calling up and the growth was up, the value was down. It's one of those pivotal years. And usually a pivotal year like that, usually at the beginning of the term, which, which it was then. But we were getting fired. Guys, and I would say, I'd said to people, only sell half, only sell half. <laughs> You're getting fired 10 times, 20 times a day. <laughs> yeah, that can't be easy. I mean, those phone calls, you get used to it over time or, you know, yeah. how do you manage that? Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and you, have, you have people who have been with you a long time, probably who who trust in it, and right, right, you build yeah. that trust over time. A lot of if we can get people through a five year time horizon, then a lot of them become believers, and um, so that's why we have some business. Up. So, when with your approach, with the dividend approach, is something that people miss very often is comparing price appreciation to the benchmark, say the S&P 500, rather than the total return based on the, you know, the price appreciation, but also, also all the dividend payments that have come in? We always compare the total return versus our return. And uh, as a guide, we're trying to beat that bogey all the time. So um, we're going to look at it without the, you know, without the dividends. We just look at it, yeah, total return on both. So one thing I found interesting in the book was the part on covered calls. So, you know, when is it, I mean, options have become, I mean, they're always kind of around and trendy, but in the last couple of years, they really exploded. I mean, in popularity, I think covered calls are a great means to kind of generate some dividend like income on an asset you're, you're owning over time if you don't want to sell it. But talk to us about when it's appropriate or when we might not want to incorporate something like a covered call. Yeah. You know, we always had the high dividend strategy, and um, uh, at the stage, this was back in uh, we started in 2010, and um, and I have, we had a couple of accounts that institutional accounts where periodically we would write on the most expensive stocks so that we wanted to sell. Well, we're looking for a new name, you know, something that's so getting overpriced. Let's sell the option, write the option, and we'll, hopefully we'll lose it. And both meanwhile, we're we'll getting paid while we lose it. And so we started that with with with, with a couple of clients. And then all of a sudden, the market, the bond market comes down, interest rates come down, broke through 2%. So you're getting down to 1%. And I'm saying, why wouldn't every single bond guy want to take a sliver of his portfolio and invest in a strategy like this? Because what you get is you get the high dividend strategy, which had about a 5%, 4.5% dividend yield. If you do the options writing on top of that, we had another 4% there. So the average yield, the average re- return for the average yield was year was about seven percent seven eight percent and uh and the risk level was even better than our high dividend strategy by about ten percent and uh so we started for that reason and we said this would be ideal for especially for because you get commissions on the trading like for tax exempt accounts and uh so we started it and i said this again would be ideal for pension accounts and um i'm a lousy salesman so we didn't do that great on the pension accounts but uh, but we have about a, a billion dollars in the strategy now, finally. But there's been more of an interest in what we see this year. It's outperforming our high dividend strategy by two or three percent, and uh, in the down market. So I think when we were down four percent, that was flat, and Mark was down, you know, ten percent. So it's an interesting area, um, and developed out of the watch the market. What can you do? I mean, you mentioned small cap. And we started, we've always had a little bit of small cap stocks, maybe in a portfolio, the value portfolio. We also had periodically some international names if they were cheaper. And uh, what you see on small caps is anytime you have a really down year in the market, the next year for small caps is phenomenal. And uh, therefore, because of that, if you look at that small cap over the last 60 years, small cap performance is pretty good. Only because you have such a recovery after a bad year, and um, but small cap is probably lining up today, probably pretty good. Small, there's a big difference between small cap value and small cap growth, of course. And um, the same with international, international. Our international portfolios actually have a higher dividend yield. You just have to be more careful of those. 
we have a little more diversification because you have more risk. And um, the uh, but the dividend yield is a lot is a little, you know it's like five and a half percent. It's a lot higher. P multiples less, and we make sure the debt's less also. And uh, so they're all outgrowths of the original strategy. So as we're kind of winding down here, I'm kind of curious. I, I like to say that I came to investing for the money, but stayed for the philosophy. I, I find that I just I find all these like kind of nice uh, frameworks for living life and um, you know being patient and you know I'm kind of curious for you. Have you found anything while we're even writing this book, perhaps that you can actually apply to your life and how to live a good life? The book was work. I mean, I write market letters about three, three or four a year, you know, going back to when I was at uh, Donaldson, I'm getting jet wrapped. So it's about 35, 40 years of writing market letters, which I'm comfortable with. Writing a book was a challenge. <laughs> and uh, so that was, you know, that was work, but uh, I love to read. So that's sort of my, but anyway, so uh, it was satisfaction to get it done. But um, but otherwise, not directly. I find reading is a good ho- hobby, reading and tennis. But um, you can go sit on the beach and uh, sometimes with the markets the way they are, I have to go sit on the be- beach with a good book and uh, hide out. <laughs> That's a really good strategy. I'm going to take that one. <laughs> well, Jim, this has been just such a wonderful conversation. I'm, I'm so excited to have you on the show and you've written this amazing book and your market letters are incredible. Everyone should check them out. Before I let you go, tell the people listening where they can find the book, where they can find more about you and your funds and those market letters exactly. Okay, I guess the uh, Amazon is where the books are. You know, you know the uh, our publisher uh, is in London <laughs> and um, the... Um, but basically, we're located in New York City, uh, Olympic Tower, 645 Fifth Avenue. We've been there for 40 years. Same same building. And uh, so if anybody wants to contact us there, want any information on our market letters or what have you, uh, that's probably the best place to get us. And uh, we're about 100, 100 of us there. We've got a floor there on uh, um, 51st and 5th. Um, if New York ever really, really, really opens up again, <laughs> So gradually, I'm here. I'm here in the hotel up on the Upper East Side. Place is booming up here, and uh, but you go down to the offices, people just aren't coming in yet. Uh, even our place, the research guys are coming in, and uh, but we're never more than half half full. But uh, but uh, but everybody's enjoying the uh, you know the openness because all of a sudden you have all these restaurants outside which you never had before in New York. So that part is a lot better. And uh, so anyway, it's <laughs> well, Jim, this has been so great. And the book is called The Case for Long-Term Value Investing, a guide to the data and strategies that drive stock market success. Thank you so much for coming on the show and spending your valuable time with us. And, and just in general teaching, using this book, using your letters and sharing the knowledge you've accrued over such a great, amazing career. So again, we really appreciate the time and, and I hope, hope to do it again soon. Thank you very much. And If you get to New York, stop by to see us. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 